Okay, everyone, we're going to wrap up tonight's forum with a presentation on backyard composting. And here to teach us is Carrie Knutson. Carrie is the horticulture agent in Grand Forks County, and she received her master's degree in horticulture from North Dakota State University. She has been working in the extension service for 15 solid years. And her favorite programs are youth gardens, and Carrie enjoys going out on house calls to help residents deal with their horticulture problems. So everybody in Grand Forks County, keep that in mind. Carrie, welcome to the forums. All right, thanks, Tom. Also have to mention Harleen was my advisor as I was getting my master's at, at NDSU. Mm -hmm. So it's a, uh, I am here because of Harleen, we'll put it that way there too. <laughs> All right, so I am good, uh, happy to be here tonight with everyone and I'm excited to talk about composting with you. Now I know not everybody thinks that talking about rotting decomposing materials is fun, uh, but I think it's exciting. My composting journey started in 2019 after I took a master composter course from Vermont Extension. And I really wanted, what I wanted to get out of that course was I was intimidated by composting. I thought it was this huge um, scientific thing and it was too much time and too much thought and I really didn't want to do it. But after I went through that course, I realized if you have a basic understanding and you commit a little bit of time to it, um, you can compost in your backyard. So that's my goal tonight is to share some knowledge and tips with you so you can start on your composting journey. First off, uh, hopefully everybody knows on the call tonight that compost is the best thing that you can do for your soil no matter what type it is, if you're in the Red River Valley and you have a heavier clay soil or you're out west and it's a little bit lighter, a little bit sandy, it's gonna increase the water holding capacity of your soil. It's gonna increase the amount of nutrients that it can, your soil can hold and compost will also add nutrients to your soil. And it's gonna increase drainage in your soil. Uh, those Organic compounds and compost are going to work with your soil and they're going to form aggregates in the soil and pore spaces and allow water to drain through the soil as well. So composting ingredients can be broken down into two basic types. I'm sure hopefully you've heard of them before. Browns, which are carbon rich, or greens, which are nitrogen rich. Browns basically are anything that's dried um, or hardish. So dried leaves, uh, nuts and eggshells are considered browns, dry flowers, newspaper, um, cardboard, shredded paper, your dry grass clippings that have not been treated with herbicide or you've waited at least uh, six weeks before you're putting that into your compost pile. Uh, straw, you can use sawdust as well, although in smaller quantities. Typical greens are fruit and vegetable scraps, a coffee or tea. A lot of times even the filters or the tea bags are degradable themselves. Fresh grass trimmings and animal manure. While you can compost almost anything that was once living, there are things that you wanna avoid, especially in a backyard compost pile. Um, the items on these lists can be composted and usually are in commercial settings, uh, but that's where the piles are, are monitored and managed uh, fairly, I don't want to say heavily, but well um, to make sure that the temperature stays hot enough and long enough to break down things quickly or kill the disease organisms. So you don't want to put in there um, any disease plants that you have from your yard or garden. You wanna make sure you keep all bird and, and pet feces. Uh, toxic plants like uh, poison ivy or you know, based on Harleen stock, if you have anything that was treated with a herbicide accidentally or on purpose, keep that out until that um, time has passed. And weeds with seeds. So if you can't kill your, your nemesis with a herbicide, don't put it in your compost pile either. Uh, if you have plants that have a seed heads on them, you don't want to put them in there because your pile won't get hot enough to kill it typically. And there's nothing worse than um, spreading weed seeds or if you have quack grass or Canada thistle, uh, spreading that to a place that doesn't have it already. 
And you also don't want to include meats, bones, dairies, fats, and oils in your compost pile. Um, as I mentioned before, those things can be used in composting, but typically in backyard piles, uh, they don't decompose fast enough. And then that's when you're going to attract those critters and pests to your yard. Ashes. Ashes can be included in compost piles at very, very, very small um, quantities. They are higher in pH, so you want to be careful with those. And any ashes that come from chol excuse me, coal or charcoal uh, should be left out as well. So the recipe for composting, uh, basically, let's think of it as a ratio, um, two to one. So two parts brown to one part green. That's the best mix of the nitrogen and carbon that gets those bacteria and organisms working in your compost pile, breaking it down. So whatever you use to collect your greens, whether that's five gallon pails, a Tupperware, or excuse me, uh, rubber made totes or garbage cans, as long as you're keeping it one green and then measure out two browns and mix the pile, you'll be fine. You will be fine. Um, there is a math formula, some algebra. If anybody wants to know that uh, formula, I can help you with that. I will share my email and you could just email me and we'll, we'll work through that if you want to get a little bit more exact um, in your recipe for your pile. But compost is pretty forgiving and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So let's talk about the recipe. How are you actually gonna put your ingredients together? The first thing to remember is particle size. You want to chop your compost ingredients so that they are in a smaller size, so they have a larger surface area and break down more quickly. If you put a whole apple in your compost pile, it's gonna take a little bit longer to, to break down than if it was cut up. And generally large things like uh, corn cobs or branches should be cut up into about a half inch piece as well. Now aeration and moisture go together. You wanna make sure that your pile is not so compacted that there is not any air movement in the pile. And you can do that by not cutting up all of your uh, hard materials like branches to make sure that there is room for air to move in there, knowing that you'll eventually have to take them out and cut them up and incorporate them into the pile. Now, if you have the right mix, you got air flowing in there, um, moisture, you want it about 40 to 60% moisture. It's said that your compost should feel like a well wrung out sponge. No, I have to be honest, I haven't actually put my hand in my compost pile and tried to wring it out if uh, to see what it feels like. I don't mind working with compost, but I don't know if I want to go that far. <laughs> uh, but you can actually tell if you're working with it. You can tell if it's a little, if it's too wet or if it's too dry. And it's something that you're going to have to monitor depending on weather conditions too. If there's not enough moisture in there, uh, the pile isn't going to break down or the items in the pile are not going to break down. In terms of volume for backyard gardeners, compost piles as small as a cubic yard in size up to um, five cubic yards in size are about manageable for composters or five feet in size. Um, any smaller than that and your compost is not going to break down very efficiently and any bigger than that you might have issues just in a in your backyard with space of, of moving and being able to, to churn it. So keep the pile between one cubic yard and about, um, so three feet up to about five feet cubed. Temperature is important for a compost pile. You want those organisms in there working and generating heat. Uh, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but you can purchase a compost thermometer and take the temperature of your compost pile daily. Uh, to make sure that it's it's heating and if the temperature goes down that means you need to churn it and start activating the bacteria getting new um, material to them and new uh, moisture and air to them so they can work the bacteria microorganisms time time is a hard thing especially in our climate when it comes to composting um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later too but you can get fresh compost or get compost made in about six months to a year. 
Hearing is the last stage when it comes to composting and it's just letting the finished compost just sit for two weeks or a month. Now finished compost should loosely resemb resemble soil. It shouldn't have any identifiable or organic matter in it. If it does, that stuff should be screened out. Um, and it shouldn't have an order, order to it. It'll just kind of smell earthy and like soil. So methods for composting, there's two basic methods, hot and fast and cool and slow. And their titles are kind of very descriptive of the different types. And you want to put some thought into which method you want to use, you know, how much time do you want to commit to being out there and working with your compost and the hot and fast method it's intensive the pile is built all at once it's put in layers and mixed and then the temperature is monitored as i mentioned early uh, earlier taking the temperature charting it when the temperature starts to decline um, then you turn it and when the pile no longer heats especially after churning then your compost is done in the cool and slow method, it's the method I use in my yard. It's pretty low maintenance. If you forget about it for a while, it's pretty forgiving. You basically do the same thing as hot and fast. You start your pile with your two parts brown to your one part greens, you mix it, but then you can keep adding materials as they are um, produced in your yard or in your home. But this method can take a long time up to six months to a year, depending on how well you manage it. In terms of composting systems, so how you want to want to set up your composting piles, there's a few things to consider, you know, the amount of material that you're going to compost. Uh, do you can you use bins, which is the most common system, or do you have a large garden that you're going to need to use piles and windrows? And then how much time do you want to commit to your, your composting as well? For compost bins, um, pretty much anything goes as you can use wire, uh, chicken wire, wire fencing, as long as it has small enough uh, spacing between the wire that your materials aren't going to fall out. You can also use wooden supports um, around the wire cage to help keep the compost in. You can use wood, as we see here um, with the pallets. There are plastic and metal type composters um, on the market. You can use recycled garbage bins as long as you drill holes in them to make sure that there's airflow. Uh, I've seen pictures of gardeners using just straw bales. Uh, that's what they had around to make their bins. Or you can use concrete blocks or patio pavers, whatever you have left over. A lot of times composters will have a multiple bin system and this enables them to have different if they're doing the hot method, they can have different stages of compost going on. Or if it's the cool and slow method, you maybe have one area to collect your browns. The middle one is where you're actually actively composting and then uh, the third bin is maybe for that curing stage of that finished compost. And as I mentioned earlier, if you have a lot of material to compost, it does not have to be kept in a neat bin. As long as you got the space, um, composting in piles and windrows works. Um, just need to have the equipment to get the piles churned. Some other methods for composting that don't require bins or windrows. Um, if you have the space in your garden, pit composting works. Essentially, you're just digging a hole in a garden area that you don't have any plants or not going to plan on growing things uh, over the season and you layer your materials in there. Uh, put your greens from your kitchen scraps in there, layer some browns on top and put soil on top and keep going until you fill up your hole. And then next year, um, use it as a walkway or put plants over the top of it and then find another space in your garden too. So you can kind of do it as a three row method alternating uh, over three years what you put where but in my garden um, anywhere I have an open space I dig a hole and I put compost in and uh, go from there so you don't have to be as exact as that. 
earlier, I think there was some questions um, with Harleen about um, starting new garden spaces. You can actually use composting to increase your garden area, whether it's for vegetables or perennials. And what is done is that in that method, if you're starting over turf, um, you would scalp the soil, you would put down a layer of newspaper or cardboard, and then you would layer your browns and greens on top uh, till it's about 18 inches high and just leave it alone. So this would be cold composting. It does require some planning in advance. Like if you know this spring or this fall or this summer, if you wanna have a new garden space next year, you would make sure you have plenty of time to put that down um, and just let it break down. And then next year you can plant into it or work it into the soil. So where should you put your composting system? There seems to be a lot of, I don't know what to call it, stigma or compost gets a bad rap that it smells and you're gonna attract pests. But if you do it correctly, you should not have either of those problems. So locating it really depends on what structures you have in your yard. You wanna keep your bins or windrows at least two to three feet away from existing structures. You want it to be in an area that's um, level and dry. You don't want it to be in a low spot in your yard where water is going to collect. You can put in our environment, um, it's recommended to put it in part sun, part shade, so it doesn't get so hot during the summer days and it gets some sunlight during the winter. You can put uh, your bins on bare soil is probably the best, but you can put them on concrete just with the understanding that eventually um, long-term composting will more than likely break down the concrete. And like I mentioned earlier, you can use any type of material. This gentleman here has a really nice composting system with some lattice work in it. That's probably prettier to look like look at um, if you need to look at your compost pile in your yard if you can't put it somewhere um, out of sight or the wire bins work too if it's somewhere not as noticeable. What kind of tools do you need for composting? Well I think you know most gardeners have the tools they need already for composting in their yard uh, with the exception of maybe a bin set up. So you will need things for chopping and shredding, whether that's a pruners or a, a big loppers. Um, if you have a lot of leaves or branches that needed to be shredded, you might think about investing in a mulcher. Um, I use an ice pick. Uh, I didn't get a lot of work this winter, but I did use it in my compost pile to chop up things. You'll also need tools uh, for mixing and churning. Uh, usually shovels are not going to work as well. A spade or a tile shovel might work to help churn, but I think a potato fork works the best um, for churning and it also serves, you know, multiple purposes too. You can use it in your garden. Uh, they do make uh, compost churners, they're actually called wing dingers that you can buy to help churn your compost piles, but I like um, multi-purpose tools, so I stick with the potato fork. Water, uh, you need to have a water source for your compost pile. You do need to add water. So a, a watering can or a garden hose if it's a larger pile. For harvesting, that's when a good old scoop shovel comes in handy to shovel the compost. And then you're gonna need to, to screen it out because uh, there will always be some materials that aren't gonna break down as fast as others and you can screen them out and then put them back into another compost pile that you already have going. Some common issues with composting. Um, I have the dog's nose up here because use your nose as you're working with your compost. If you can smell something like ammonia or rancid butter or vinegar, that means there's issues with your pile and you need to take some time uh, turning it, um, adding maybe browns if things are too wet to help soak up the moisture or um, maybe some bulking agents too, as I mentioned earlier, some sticks or bigger items to increase airflow. 
If your compost isn't heating, usually that means it's too dry. So add some vegetable scraps because they are really high in water content or add some water to your compost pile. If you have non-decomposed later, layers, that goes back to um, probably not having enough air movement in your compost pile. So churning it will help. If you have non-decomposed items, that goes back to the size of the item. If it's branches or larger chunks, um, surprisingly, eggshells need to be broken down too. I mean, you would think that they're so delicate, they break. Um, I learned this lesson the hard way all winter by just throwing eggshells into my compost pile and then finding out they, they look exactly like they did the day I put them in there. So breaking up even eggshells um, will help your compost decompose faster. If you have insect pests, you know, um, millipedes, pill bugs, um, different things like that are good for a decomposting pile or for a compost pile. But if you have lots of flying insects, that might mean um, you have too many greens in there, your pile's too wet, you need to add some browns. Or if you're adding kitchen scraps, you need to make sure that you're capping the pile, putting a good layer of browns over those greens so those flying insects can't get to them. And rodents, uh, you sh really shouldn't have a problem with rodents as long as you're keeping away from those meats, uh, dairies, and oil products in your compost pile. Um, but if you do feel like you're having an issue with four-legged creatures, you can always put some chicken wire around your bin um, to, keep it, to keep out those pests. And I think we're just about out of time. I had a couple minutes. I wanna talk about winter composting. This is, uh, for me, one of the most valuable things I learned during my uh, master composter course is we can take advantage of our cold temperatures in North Dakota. We can store our vet fruit and vegetable scraps over winter. You just need to collect brown leaves in the fall, have a, uh, I use trash bins with holes drilled on the sides, sides. I layer leaves, dump in my brown, or my, excuse me, my greens as they are produced in the kitchen, put a layer of browns on them, um, keep going over winter. And then when the temperature starts uh, warming up outside, I either compost directly in my bins or I might dump them out in a, a wire uh, bin system so they can compost over the summer. All right, that's all I have. I got questions, hopefully. Yes, we do, Carrie. Here we go. When you say the magic recipe is two parts brown and one part green, is that by volume or by weight? Volume. So it's it's a five. You put a five gallon pail in there. You. Well, I can see why you would think weight too, because your wet greens are going to be, or your vegetable scraps are going to be a little bit harder. I would start by just by volume, and as you work with your pile. Um, you're, you will see that you're going to need to add browns, especially with vegetable scraps, because they produce so much moisture, moisture as they decompose. Okay, how about what do you do if your compost pile is too dry? Can you add more greens or should you just give it water? You can do both. You can add more greens if you have those readily available or just add water and you don't want to add too much. Remember, you don't want a, a sopping wet pile. Think of it as a, a dry, a wrung out sponge. So okay. you can do both. Can we compost colored newsprint? That one, I... That's a good question. I don't know that I have an answer off. I think you can do newspaper because that is soy. A lot of the inks are soy based, but I'm not sure on colored paper. I was just going to look here and see if I can find the answer. And of course I can't. You know, I think this is an issue many, many years ago that they were, uh, toxic chemicals in the color newsprint but now now it's all soy based so mm -hmm. I don't think you really have to worry about it no I don't know that I'd use like colored paper left over from arts and crafts I would recycle that but I don't know that I would put that in my compost pile how about uh, do you have to worry about methane or carbon dioxide emissions with that pit style of composting 
I never have, I have yet to have issues with that in my, in my garden. So I haven't noticed any, any weird smells. I think um, the soil, the organisms in the soil do a good job breaking it down efficiently. And it's not, it's not like a landfill where it's captured and there isn't things there to uh, decay the material. You do have to watch out for if you have dogs in your yard and you use pit composting, um, they will love to dig in those areas. Okay. How about, what do you think about those plastic tumbler composters? those barrel composters that you turn, are they quicker? To me, that's a slow uh, type of composting. It's if you're going to add material uh, continuously to it, if you fill it and let it go and you are able to turn it that way, in theory, they should be a little bit faster because it's easier for you to turn and there might be more airflow in it. But it all comes up to how you manage it too. Do you use the same recipe with those? tumbler systems yep two to one it's just the basic um, composting recipe do you know do you have a general idea about how often do you need to turn a pile maybe hot or cold methods uh hot methods it really depends on the temperature so it could be um, every couple days or once a week uh, for cold composting at least once a week. Uh, you can do less. Sometimes I forget to turn it, turn it more one week than the other week. It, it's pretty forgiving. You mentioned temperature. Is there like a target temperature that you want to reach? A good range of temperature for composting is 105 to 150. Okay. And how about, can you use citrus rinds in the compost? Sure, might even smell good for a while. <laughs> How do you, you mentioned curing compost. How do you cure it? It's, you know, if, are there any bread makers out there where you just leave the dough alone and you let it rise? You don't do anything with it. That's kind of what curing is. You just let it set, it's finished. Uh, you can cover it so you're not, if it rains, uh, which I hope it does around here. Uh, you're not adding any water to it, but it just gives uh, the compost a chance to kind of mellow out if there was any improper management. If there was some anaerobic decomposition, it gives it the chance to mellow out and leach out a little bit of those compounds before you use it in your garden. Okay, uh, how about you can't use droppings from a chicken coop, is that right? <laughs> Chicken manure. Chicken manure, those types of manures need to be composted on their own and they should be composted for a long time before you're putting them into your garden. It's not that you can't compost with them, um, but they need to age a long time before you're killing those, the bacteria in there you put in your comp. I'm not real caught up on. Um, Animal manure, animal manure composting. So I don't know if I can give a good answer to that. Okay. How about pine needles? You can include them in, in limited amounts too in your compost pile. You know, if, they were, if they're dry, I wouldn't want that to be your only source of your, your nitrogen or excuse me, your carbon. How about, uh, should you put a compost pile in a greenhouse? Oh, well, that's an interesting, <laughs> interesting question. It would stay warm year round, so there would be some benefits to it. Um, I that, don't know. <laughs> this is waste we're talking about. Are you going to put that in a greenhouse? Come on, well, don't get any plants. <laughs> My goodness. Okay, uh, we already. Uh, what ratio? of completed, how much compost can you add to your garden beds? Do you have a, what amount should you, like an inch of it to your garden beds or what do you recommend? I think typically it's adding one to two inches um, over the top layer of your garden soil and working it in. Um, you can do that every year. A lot of people put just used compost as mulch over the growing season too. Um, put a few inches over the top of the soil and then work it in the fall too. Okay, I know you mentioned sawdust. Uh, is there a limit on how much sawdust you can use in a compost pile? And are there any special types of 
wood that should or should not be used? So for sawdust, you want to stick to, um, I want to say true sawdust that comes from milling lumber, not a sawdust that's left over from cutting plywood or um, any wood material that has glue in it because of those compounds mm -hmm. being in your compost. And sawdust is really fine. Um, it's if you put too much in, your compost pile is going to compact and you're going to have aeration issues. So you can use it. Um, I would mix it in with some leaves and then use that as your browns and mix in with your greens. I wouldn't want to have just a layer of, of compost in there. Speaking of sawdust, can you, can you just put that in the garden before you till it up or do you think it should be composted first? It needs to be composted first. You need to break down um, the carbon that's in there. Otherwise, you will tie up all the nitrogen in your garden uh, will be used to break down that sawdust and it will not be available to your plants. Okay, Carrie, what do you think about verma composting? Have you ever done it? I have never done it. I've heard uh, people having great luck with that. Uh, what I have heard is people with issues that the worms multiply so fast that they uh, don't have enough to materials to feed the worms and then having to get rid of the worms um, after that is sometimes an issue. How about, um, so is worm composting better than just standard composting or doesn't really make a difference? Or? You know, I don't know that I can answer that, but to me, as long as you're composting, it, it's good. <laughs> not let putting it in the landfill should should you put worms in your compost pile nope don't do not that. not outside no nope. and uh you know what this this person we had a question for jan about this composting but i thought you're the one who should answer it it's uh the person they have a garden tower that calls for reg wigglers for composting have you ever heard of that they are, I think they're the most common type of worm that's sold for composting because uh, in nature, that's where they live. Like if you think of them in the forest, um, they live right in that leaf litter area. So they eat organic matter and they decompose and that's what they do. So that, I mean, that makes sense to me that that's the type of worm they're asking for. And can you just get that at a bait shop or? <laughs> I think. Go to Amazon for that or? I don't know. I, that's one thing Amazon might not sell. I don't know. Um, you have to, there are lots of businesses on the internet that will sell you um, the red wigglers, but do some research and make sure, uh, get down to scientific names. Like we have scientific mm. names for plants. Make sure, and I don't know what the scientific name for red wigglers is right now, but do a little bit of research and make sure you're actually buying what they say you're buying um, and you have to be careful too because um, some worms you are not native uh, to North Dakota and you might be introducing um, a non-native species that could cause problems so make sure you do your homework. Wow invasive worms huh? Yep there's cool. always something. <laughs> wow how about we got a gardener who's very lazy and she refuses to turn her compost pile Will it ever be composted naturally? I would liken that to sheet composting. So if you, the best thing to do is collect your ingredients and then layer them and then leave it alone and eventually it will break down. But you want to make sure that you have that two to one in there. Otherwise, it's not, not going to have the right amount of nutrients for those bacteria and microorganisms to work on the pile. Now you mentioned about ash. You can use a little bit of ash from burning twigs. Um, how much can you use? <laughs> that is really hard um, to find an answer. It's, it's a little. Um, I think the recommendation, if you have a lot of ashes, uh, people always wanna put them in gardens or in their lawns. And it's like a five gallon pail for a thousand square feet is the recommendation. So uh, for ashes in a compost pile, um, definitely not the main ingredient in your pile, maybe just to help give it a little bit of um, air moving or pore space in there. And you said ash can make your soil, can make it more alkaline or it raises the pH, I should say. I think it can because um, wood ashes have a generally higher pH. 
Um, now, I don't know if anybody has read about biochar, uses biochar. That's made a little bit differently. And there's a lot of research into using biochar and in, in compost. But for um, us here, at least on the Red River Valley side of North Dakota with our high pH soils, you don't want to keep adding high pH ingredients um, to the soil you have. Right. How about where can someone take a master composter class, Carrie? <laughs> I look for Vermont Extension. Uh, uh, I think what it's, about Grand Forks? I know I'm not a master composter, yet, even oh, though I took on. the class. Um, but if you have questions, I'd be more uh, than happy to visit with you about them. Like, like I said, I'm still on my journey. Um, I learned something different every day. I was just out churning my pile uh, and I had a corner that smelled like ammonia and I thought I'm not doing a good enough job I'm getting air movement in there. So it's a journey. Well, you're well along the journey. You know, you don't have to be like the Dalai Lama, you know, you can just Correct. be like a very far along master master <laughs> composter just a like, researcher yep figuring okay. it out <laughs> uh how about can a person put dried leaves directly into the garden in the fall or will that use up will they take up too much carbon to break it down without composting first should you put dried leaves in the garden in the fall oh i don't hmm. I don't know that I have an answer for that. And I'm, if anything, oh, there's all sorts of things running through my mind. You could chop them up and you could use them as, mix them with uh, green grass clippings and you could use them as uh, mulch in the garden. You know, I'm not sure on that, Tom. What do you think? I don't, I just. You know what? It's uh, anything in moderation yeah. is okay, but there's a risk when you put, those uh, those browns, as you say, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think one of the biggest risks is people who put too much on. Then the garden is very slow to warm up in the springtime. Very mm -hmm. slow. It can delay for weeks, and uh, it's too yeah. much organic matter. I just think just a I just a, a little bit, an inch maybe, but mm -hmm. and then work it in if you want to. But collect them in garbage bags to use over the summer if you need browns. Yeah. Uh, okay, this person has a huge compost pile and they have someone come in with the skid steer in spring and then in fall to turn it. Is that okay? Twice a year. You're probably not going to get compost very fast. <laughs> and if that's, that's what you can do, I mean, that's fine. Um, yeah. It, it's... It's all the amount of time and effort you want to put into it. If you don't want compost immediately, it's kind of cold composting. So, and just a couple more to go here. How about uh, the, a little about that elevated tumbler compost? You know, people keep talking about that on the barrel bins. Like, and you see those ads now. It's like, oh, you can have compost in three weeks, that kind of thing. Are they any good or is it just a scam? I, I think it all goes down to what you put in the bin. If you uh, measure out your browns and greens, get them in there and then churn the, use it to churn. I think it's a good method. If, if it works for you, um, try it. I don't, I mean, there's some days that I wish I had one because I think it would be easier to churn. Um, I don't think mm -hmm. there's, I don't think it's a scam. I think it's a good system, but you have to start with the right recipe and the right ingredients and monitor it to get it to work. So we've got a master gardener who says she's su surprised because how come you can't use bird manure? I think that comes down to the bacteria. Um, in, in backyards, you can't, oftentimes backyard gardeners are not gonna get your pile hot enough and for long enough to kill that bacteria. And we don't want you spreading that in your garden and then eating a green bean and getting sick. Okay, that sounds good. Carrie, I want to thank you. You've inspired a lot of people into having compost piles. You made it sound so easy. <laughs> and uh, thank you. And also, I want to say thank you to everybody out there. Mm -hmm.